A very warm welcome to Doorway to Sindh, presented by Sindhi Culture Foundation and the Embassy Group. My love for Sindh grew from the stories my grandmother and father shared of the happy memories of home, which I'm sure many of you have heard from your parents and grandparents. I used to consider it a compliment when somebody said to me that I don't look like a Sindhi or I don't dress like a Sindhi, till one day I questioned why I considered it a compliment. I then realized that what had survived was the food and knew nothing about our material culture from which we were divorced. That is when my journey to discover Sindhi history and culture began as I unwrapped the negative perceptions and embraced my rejected identity. We invite you to Doorway to Sindh to join us in our journey to discover Sindh's rich history and culture. One week at a time, we will bring to you videos in conversation with eminent scholars, artists, musicians and poets. You will see images of Sindh's ancient sites, monuments, architecture, textiles and craft traditions from antiquity. We hope that this glimpse inspires you to discover more about Sindhi history and culture. We welcome Professor Sarah Ansari and Professor Vita Kothari for joining us today in this unique discussion on Sindh real and imagined. They have shared their learning over decades on Sindh. This unique discussion will unfold realities and perceptions of Sindh real and imagined. I now call on Trisha Lal Chandani to continue. I am Aruna Matnani, a proud Sindhi. The many years of living away from Sindh have allowed us to conjure our own versions of Sindh, which then allow us to be Sindhi in varying degrees in whichever part of the world we inhabit. Being a Sindhi and being close to Sindh, consequently, are two mutually exclusive categories for a lot of us. Today, we have two eminent professors with us to share their journeys of engagement with Sindh and the people of Sindh. Our speakers today examine what Sindh means to them, how they came to shape their position vis-a-vis -vis the study of Sindh and Sindhis, and how this relationship has evolved over the years of research. Let me introduce them to you. Dr. Sarah Ansari is Professor of History of South Asia at Royal Holloway, University of London. Much of her research has focused on the 19th and 20th century history of the province of Sindh and more broadly explored issues linked to religion, migration, identity, citizenship and gender. Her latest monograph, Boundaries of Belonging, Localities, Citizenship and Rights in India, co-written with William Gold, appeared in late 2019, while her earlier publications include Sufi Saints and State Power, The Peers of Sindh, 1843 to 1947, and Life After Partition, Migration, Community, and Strife in Sindh, 1947 to 1962. Professor Ansari has conducted collaborative research projects and writing workshops with universities. She is the editor of the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society. Dr. Rita Kothari is Professor of English at Ashoka University, Delhi. Her ethnographic research on the Sindhi community in India has been pioneering, opening up scholarly inquiry into marginal communities and borders in Western India, as well as practices of religion, language, gender, and caste in the community. As a multilingual scholar, Professor Kothari has translated novels and poetry from Gujarati and Sindhi to English, while also critically engaging with the theoretical aspect of translation and untranslatability. Among her many publications, the monographs Memories and Movements, Borders and Communities in Bunni, Kutch, Gujarat, and The Burden of Refuge, The Sindhi Hindus of Gujarat, as well as the anthology of Sindhi Stories of Partition, translated and edited by her as seminal in the area of Sindhi studies. We welcome you both. Uh, please also share today's link. Uh, the link for today's session with friends and family so that they can join us in time. Uh, and now over to you, Professor Ansari and Professor Kothari. Okay, well, thank you, Trisha, for introducing us so, um, so positively. I think I'm really looking forward to talking with Rita about things that we've, we've touched on briefly in our preparations for today, but hopefully we can expand upon them. I don't know about you, Rita, but do you think it would be good to go first by doing what Trisha pointed to, which is, I suppose, explaining our own connections to mm -hmm. um, 
to this particular part of the world, region of South Asia. I don't know if you'd like to go first, being so a I Cindy. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think that is what should give me a legitimacy uh, at this moment. But, you know, while Trisha was speaking about us, and uh, I think I'll take off from there because there's a question, there's a point that occurred to me, which I hadn't thought of before, which is that uh, my being a Sindhi and yet being so distant from the geography of Sindh, which is really the baseline where I was, right? And in a way, you're not being a Sindhi, but being proximate to the geography of Sindh was your baseline. And so <clears throat> I think it's quite interesting. Then our starting points are one of perhaps you saying to yourself that you don't know this region and that you will now make it your business to know it, right? Whereas as a Sindhi, I could grow up with a delusion that I know what I need to know or that what I haven't known may not even be relevant to me. And a lot of families actually in the Indian diaspora, the Sindhi diaspora, made Sindh very irrelevant for their children. They hardly talked about the region of Sindh. Right? Uh, people would tell their children that we came from Larkano or we came from Shikarpur or we came from Hyderabad and so on, If whenever those stories were tell. So sometimes those words would fall on, on the ears of the next generation. But by and large, Sindh was not a very relevant category for us. There was a category of being Hyderabadi, being Shikarpuri, being Larkano, being Sakhar and so on. And therefore, this question of what it is to know Sindh for one who's, who is from Sindh in some sense, but that connection has been severed and it is not just severed, it's muted. It's muted in that interaction, right? With the, with the older generation. And that quest actually is a very strange one. It's a combination of knowing and not knowing, right? Of having some resonances, but also not quite knowing. And I think uh, I will talk about that a little bit later. But let me let me see what you have to say about. Uh... Yes, I think that's so interesting because, as you said, we're coming in a sense to sin from different directions. But in a way, we we haven't, I suppose, ended up at exactly the same space. That would be impossible. But we've had maybe similar challenges along the way. Because, you know, as I've said, my own encounter with Sindh really began with me wanting to, in a way, understand its present better when I was introduced to the region through the lucky or the fortunate coincidence of marrying someone whose family lived there. Yeah. But um, at the same time, my husband's family, you know, being Urdu speaking as opposed to Sindhi, yet having come to Sindh before 1947, um, so in a way, having a different relationship, perhaps with the yeah. province to the vast majority of people who arrived after partition. I, I think I, I had to try and almost perform a double act, which was both um, get to know the place better, in inverted commas, through my own studies and my own interactions, but also in a way, how can I say, um, I think I was part of maybe a slightly bigger exercise, certainly on that I saw happening in my own you know, family, um, which was rooting themselves also in Sindh um, and almost being seen to be part and parcel of that part of the world because I was doing my studies at a time when ethnic, so-called ethnic pressures and, and tensions were particularly strong in sin. So I think, although possibly I didn't have, I certainly didn't have that, um, that complexity of your own relationship with the region, I think my getting to know it was more complicated than simply being an outsider coming in and trying to work out yeah. what had happened, what was happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I quite understand. And I think when we look at the politics of sin, and especially between the tensions between Sindhi nationalists and Muhajirs 
and you know or urdu speaking families in karachi it's a very very fraught relationship so i'm sure mediating through that and understanding the region on your own terms would have been would have been quite a challenge uh, i think i mean this this today's session is called real and imagined sin yeah. almost to say that that we would know what the real is but maybe we could talk about how, what are these imaginations of sin right and uh, i mean maybe that is the only humble task we can do and the thing is as i mentioned earlier that sindh was not actually brought up that frequently in in diasporic families and i don't know what trisha has to say about it and many other people would have to say about it but this was my observation back then i don't know whether it still gets vindicated or not uh but when uh when in the early conversations i discovered kind of early on that there was something here that was different from the punjab right which was really all one knew that there was something distinctive going on here but what is that distinction about is came to me from different quarters so i was reading cloth markovits right and in some sense it was explaining to me where my ancestors came from because they were also shikarpuris and i remember my father mentioning how my grandfather would go to tashkent then bukhara for trade on a camel back and that he had seen some papers at home but all that story was gone there was nothing left from it but i felt like claude markovits was one of the early books i read and i felt like it had filled one gap for me which is that this region has had these huge global networks right and uh, the second thing that happened is that whenever i would hear people talk about partition in the context of punjab and then go on to meet uh, <clears throat> partition survivors from sindh the experience seemed quite different and i think that is another interesting thing which is history and experience i mean you are trained as a historian sara i am not right and in some sense i went to history entirely by intuition and i proceeded from a place of experience i proceeded from a place of feeling you know when aruna mentioned earlier that if someone said you don't look like a sindhi she thought it was a compliment i certainly saw it as a compliment and when i began to interview a lot of young people around when i was writing burden of refuge many of them saw it as a compliment and so in some sense the experience of that unease of that shame of that discomfort became the basis of almost a historical document right now when i look back and i'm looking at all kinds of projects we do and i feel that maybe we don't own up enough how experience has been the site of knowledge making that our experience does play a very important role but we seldom actually own up to its role we think of that as only a, a starting point or even a pretext rather than text itself or an anecdote or a case study or something personal but we don't think of it as evidence right so i mean i'm i'm sure you can pick up john scott here so this idea of history experience as evidence has become very very important for me and now when i look back upon my work on sindh i feel like i i that was really my starting point and in some sense i think the idea of shame the idea of wanting to become something else so that the gaze of the other that falls upon you does not make you out to be this you know greedy dirty uneducated illiterate sindhi person that a lot of gaze made out the sindhis to be in india uh, has been actually the basis of a lot of work that i went on to do and i think that has also been in some sense my it has i think deepened my understanding of communalism in india because i think it is communalism in india is not only about hindus and muslims it is also about who reminds the hindus of being muslim like mm. there is a lot of proxiness to it that even people who remind them of being muslim like are often then become these undesirable sort of you know characters and so on so in some sense i think i want to own up today at least to, you know 
of how much experience uh, plays a role in our sites of knowledge making. And I would love to ask you as to whether as a historian who would have been trained to be this objective historian somewhat outside it and not inside it, how did you negotiate this? And do you find yourself wanting to be inside uh, in, the, in the years to come? How do you see that business of objectivity and being outside? No, those are fantastic thoughts and questions. I'm thinking back to when I first, you know, embarked on being a historian and when I was doing my PhD, which um, explored the, um, I suppose, role of peers, Sufi, you know, sort of saints in inverted commas, but the Sajjad and Nasheen families that obviously yeah. control these huge, huge, um, hugely important religious sites. I do remember at that time, and this was the 80s, um, being advised by my PhD supervisor that fine, it was okay to go and talk to you know the current incumbents to ask people about what it felt to be a Marid and so forth. But unless I could um, corroborate anything that I found in written form in the archives, I couldn't rely on it. Yeah. Thirty years later, with the rise of oral history, yeah. clearly, you know, we 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 handle as historians this kind of material evidence in a very different way and I think right. you know it's taking in a way it takes us to your point about um, history as experience because we we know much better as historians we don't always get it right but in theory we know much better how to how to use memory in a way that's unlocked through oral yeah. testimonies to yeah. support and even drive our historical yeah. inquiries so that's that's one thing that now I wouldn't and with my own students, I would never say what was said to me in good faith, I should say, because that was the way <laughs> it was seen. Um, in terms of, I suppose, owning up, I mean, I, I certainly try in a way to own up to that, to that connection, because I think it's like you've just said, and like I tried to say a moment ago, I think it's really driven my my whole experience, my own kind of encounter, let's say, yeah. with the past through being a historian. What I think is quite interesting are some of those personal um, reflections that you just shared. And I'll just pick out two of them to kind of, in a way, comment on. The first thing is that um, you said that point about not looking like a Cindy, you know, that, that idea. For me, as somebody coming from further outside present day yeah. Sindh to Sindh, one of the biggest compliments that I felt I ever got was when I was, I remember interviewing somebody and they were a little bemused by who I was because there's somebody with the surname Ansari. You know, she doesn't look too foreign. I didn't, maybe, you know, she, you know ask me, you know, are you British Pakistani? Is your father something and your mother white? Or, anyway, I felt like I was being seen as possibly half an insider and that, that made me feel quite special. Yeah. But the other thing that you also picked up on this idea of, the, the kind of image of the Sindhi and in post-independence yeah. India, you know, being sort of, you know, you talked about shame and you talked about this idea of the uneducated, the illiterate and so forth. Seen from my perspective, as somebody who's obviously studied Sindh in the 19th and 20th centuries, my, the, the, the very strong impression that I've always had of Sindhis who may, so let's call them for argument's sake, so non-Muslim Sindhis who left, is yeah. that they they were incredibly you know um you know yeah. as you say cosmopolitan educated i mean schools are, after yeah. 1947 i mean just yeah. you know were bereft of teachers yeah. colleges also so this idea of of somehow ill-educated illiterate or and so forth just doesn't yeah. register yeah. with me yeah and you're so right actually i discovered this later when i traveled to sindh mm -hmm. you know when i would see so many schools and colleges and so yeah, so I don't I, I don't know how these impressions were formed. I think scholars like Trisha are working much more now on the on on contemporary things, and maybe we could explore that later through new scholarship. My own feeling was that when the Sindhis arrived and they and they dispersed themselves in various cities and different refugee camps, I think the squalor of those refugee camps, the poverty of it, the fact that these camps would be situated outside the heart of the city and so forth, and people are trying to make, you know, two ends meet, that 
really speaking, schools and colleges and education seems to be put on the back burner for a while. It does happen. They do then. And I think Nandita Bhavnani's work also shows that they do establish institutions, but that happens much later. And I think the Amils of Sindh, who are these very educated people, and they are the ones who usually establish these institutions, they would have maybe found their, themselves in Delhi, Bombay, certain kinds of civil services, jobs, and so on. So the impressions that I talk about would have a certain demographic explanation. Maybe they were not universal, and I don't want to universalize it. Trisha, do you have something to say? Uh, yeah, this is the perfect moment for me to come in. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I was waiting for a pause. Uh, but I absolutely believe that, uh, you know, from everything that you've spoken, I'll just uh, say uh, a few things that, I, that struck me. Uh, first of all, uh, as Professor Ansari, uh, Ansari was talking about her being a historian and uh, Professor Kothari coming from a different kind of space, uh, my work at, at the moment combines both history and anthropology. And I have come to realize that when you're studying sins or the people of sins, uh, you cannot just rely, uh, they can't, cannot be watertight disciplinary, disciplinarian uh, boundaries, you know, you have to, there is, a, there is no way that the archive can substitute what I will find in the streets. Yeah. Uh, and especially as an academic who's working in India, my fieldwork is in Delhi, uh, it, it will eventually take me to other places. Uh, I feel very, very strongly uh, about uh, how lacking the archives are in India. Uh, and uh, as a scholar who's, uh, you know, trying to gather information, I inevitably have to uh, plug those gaps uh, by talking to people. Uh, but talking to people brings to mind the question of distance for me. Uh, because like Professor Kothari was talking about uh, when she first started uh, speaking about uh, how we think of sins, sins real or imagined, uh, people would talk about them being Shikarpuris or them being from Larkana or Sakhar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now with my generation, uh, there are so many of us who do not talk like that anymore. We don't know where our ancestors came from. We know we are Sindhi. We know there's some place called Sindh where people came from, uh, but that's about it. So my, my, I'm wondering if these distinctions that had existed, say, even uh, in, you know, say my parents' generation, uh, they have, um, uh, you know, they have been, uh, they have eroded, right? Uh, so has that contributed to a cohesive concept, cohesive notion of sins and a cohesive, cohesively imagined sin? Uh, or has that taken away from how Sindhis identified themselves? I don't know how that works. It's a question I'm, I'm still trying to understand. Uh, so are you saying those distinctions don't matter even where marriages are concerned? That is when they matter the most. Uh, they used to. They used to, but uh, like I said, with distance, you're talking about uh, post the post-migrant generation. And uh, when we talk about Sindh and the Sindhis and the diaspora, uh, we can't evade the question of how nostalgia or how distance uh, or how memories or all the question of assimilation, the question of language, how it affects this generation, which uh, did not see the squalor of the refugee camps. Uh, which did not, uh, uh, you know, embody uh, the proxy Muslim, uh, 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 you know, uh, characteristics. So how, how does that affect this generation? Uh, one last bit about the distance, the question of distance is, uh, like you were talking about the insider, outsider, um, being the insider uh, and being the outsider can make a lot of difference, of course. Uh, but I was wondering if that question, if that identity is made fuzzy uh, by how well you know the language. Right. Uh, Professor Kothari, of course, uh, speaks Sindhi, Gujarati and has done a lot of work in Gujarat. But, um, so I assume that you're able to communicate far better with uh, the people there. Uh, 
Professor Ansari has spoken about how uh, Urdu uh, has replaced, in, in your work also, uh, Professor Ansari, you've spoken about how uh, Urdu replaces uh, Sindhi in Sindh. Uh, but I wonder if uh, somebody like me, who does not speak Sindhi very well, uh, I don't know where I lie. I don't know if I'm an insider or an outsider. Uh, and I, uh, I wonder how that affects my um, involvement with the question of uh, uh, Sindhi identity. Yeah, I'll, I'll just come back quickly, just with a first, uh, not clarification, but I don't want to, you know, be responsible for <laughs> misleading anybody through my work, really. But it's obviously Urdu now has, has squeezed out a lot of, you know, has kind of inserted itself and I suppose reduced space in some ways for Sindhi. But, uh, you know, Sindhi is still, a, you know, a lot, a widely spoken and you know vibrant language that yeah. Cindy's you know really really um, you know value and has it has come very much to represent their identity in many ways. So language is at the heart of a lot of let's say real yeah. Sind today. I mean, language hasn't gone away. It may be flipped in a slightly different way to what you're talking about in India, but Cindy the Cindy language. You know, it's one of those core aspects of Sindhi identity that is is very much present, and yeah. um, it may it may need need a lot of defending, yeah. uh, but it's still very much there. And I think um, I suppose that's just something I would want to highlight. Yeah, I think uh, what I was also trying to say was, um, uh, you know, how we see Sindhi language being challenged by. Uh, competing with other languages uh, among people, among the Sindhi community who lives in India, uh, different parts of India, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Delhi, speaking different languages, but Sindhi, uh, or and Sindhi, uh, we find the parallel in Pakistan where Sindhi, again, is competing with Urdu. So when you think about Sindh, you're not just thinking about Sindhi as the primary uh, uh, dominant uh, linguistic channel, uh, but there is a competitor there, so uh, that's that's I mean that's a parallel that uh, that I've that I think exists. I think I want to fine tune that a little bit, uh, Trisha, and say that while in in Pakistan, the because the state was so overt in its marginalization of sin. That as Sarah says, Sindhi language became a very important bulwark of Sindhi nationalism. Okay? In India, the state was not coercive, right? And if the languages were competing, they were also competing against each other and also against English. So in that sense, Sindhi was not uniquely placed. But what happened was that Sindhi simply did not have any, any mirroring of its world outside. It had no purpose, which some languages also need reinforcement from external worlds for their existence. And Sindhi, in that sense, was rendered quite irrelevant in the kind of linguistic economy that came to obtain in India. So because the state was not coercive, it also did not evoke a kind of a rebellion and a desire to preserve the language, the community collaborated with the state and with the market forces in making Sindhi irrelevant. So I think the, the situation is actually almost, almost antithetical in some sense where language is concerned. So I, in one of, one of the papers I've talked, I think it's a book chapter, it's a paper called The Paradox of a Linguistic Minority where I say, ask this question, what it is to be called by the Indian constitution to be a linguistic minority, but not actually have your language. And there is a conversation between a writer in India and a writer in Sindh. And the Sindhi primers that somebody has created for the Muhajirs, you've got someone from the Indian side asking that person to say, why don't you send these primers here to the Itana Sindhi bhi nataga and Sindhi boli. Right? And so this idea that ke log sindhi nahi bol rahe is a much bigger sort of a thing than the fact that our language or our language is completely 
तो थोड़ा थोड़ा उस चीज का जो जो फर्क है वो आई थिंक काफी अहमियत वाला है एंड आई जस्ट वॉन्टेड टू काइंड ऑफ पुट इट आउट है But going back to the earlier point that Sara is making, and that so that also ties up with the Cinderella and Imagine theme, which is that I also began to see over a period of time that language creates these different sins, right? It creates these different cartographies. So, for instance, in Kutch, in Western Rajasthan, in Washington, in other parts of California, I began to discover these lit oases. जितने मानो सिंधी गालें, so you will have the, you know, certain communities, the हाले पोटा, राईसी पोटा, मुतवा and so on in Bani, then you would have the Manganiars and so on in Western Rajasthan, and then when you go abroad, and you find in London and then you find in Washington, and I began to think then that the affect of being in those surroundings. was almost always like being a part of a sindhi world like when i would walk into the sindhi nationalist meeting in washington or in london it would almost feel like i was visiting my chacha's house where i had like eight cousins and their wives and their children the hum the sociality of the entire community are rita ate ve rita tiwan kha hi kha acha sa ghar ji viu the sociality was so much like being part of a sindhi universe that i began to actually think of that affect as one that is produced by language and one that creates for me these different cartographies of sindh because otherwise what tends to happen is that we freeze the notion of sindh as only and consign it only to a particular geography and because as some of us like trisha and me we can't go there quite often that geography becomes more and more intense in our mind and i feel like this also makes us think of the here and there as this very discrete units but we don't think that these borders are also bleeding and have always bled that there are sindhi speaking pastoral muslim communities in india and all our research is so heavily focused only upon people like us upon hindus that over a period of time i began to think of what is sindhiness actually mean for me that if i find us that am sardars who belong to the sikh tradition they are sindhi and then you've got these pastoral communities who are sindhi then you've got these musicians in western rajasthan who are sindhi so then why am i living with this frozen idea of one kind of sindhi and and but if i were to make that to use trisha's word very fuzzy then what would sindhiness mean this is also a question i ask myself uh so i'm not sure i have the answer because if i were to say language is the answer then i might you know trisha brought up the idea of the insider and the outsider and i don't want to i don't want to kind of i don't know what's the word underscore too much the idea of the insider outsider or the authentic one or the inauthentic one i'm not interested who are we to pass a judgment and make those verdicts and so on but i think i'm only talking about i'm only talking about how it is once again experience and affect that actually drove even this observation because i think it's language produces that in a way that it is the closest to your skin it is the most intimate thing and it is it it's uh it doesn't happen if you enter into a party and you are meeting sindhis but they are not speaking the language the affect is very different you might still feel a warm fuzziness but i think what i am talking about is different and i'm wondering whether for me that is the basis of these multiple ideas of sindh that i want to think about one that does not include only the hindu sindhis I think I've talked too much. Please over. Now that's again really interesting. I just wonder. I mean, I see where you're coming from when it comes to language, but again, to just think about it. Say, for example, if you go to Sindh, present day Sindh today, and you meet people, and you you find that, you know, often maybe it's within particular classes, but you find so-called intermarriage. You know, between Sindhis and say, either people, yeah, like kind of, or just. Yeah, or do you speak in background or Punjabi or wherever, and 
you know, does that mean perhaps, you know, that their children or, you know, subsequent generation, do they see themselves as Cindy? In the experience that I come across, yes, they do. They value their Cindiness, but they don't see themselves as being just, I suppose, limited to yeah. that Cindiness. Yeah. Yeah. But I just wonder again, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking, is, is it, or oh, no, let me start that point again. Is what matters really how people self-identify? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is it is it people self-identifying as Cindy or is it that we need other people to point fingers at us and say, you are this or you are a Cindy? Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, and yeah. maybe, um, I don't know the, the different groups of, of, of Cindy's that yeah. you've just referenced, whether they would call themselves that or whether they they still think of themselves as as yeah. part, part and parcel of sort of smaller subgroupings yeah. almost that are the most yeah. meaningful for them. No, and also we curate different pieces of our identity. So it's not even as if it is inherited or static or entirely ascribed. We also mm. take convenient positions. We also curate it depending on the interlocutors uh, mm. and so forth. And like you, even I married outside outside my group and so on so uh i understand i'm not no um, but i think it's 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 a question that's not easy to answer but i yeah. do you think i mean you obviously unlike me i mean are able to sort of track and trace let's say you know the what happened next after 1947 and i think you know we have i think at least we have to recognize that the border the new frontier that was created at the time of partition, as you were hinting earlier, you know, had a different impact on yeah. on many on, on the experience of many Sindhis as compared with, say, what was going on further north in the Punjab or over in Bengal. Although those two stories are different anyway. Yeah. But um, this idea of the you know the frontier being this this kind of this gash almost that you know tears the landscape in two, or a scar, or you know those kinds of metaphors. Um, I wonder when we think of sin, while it certainly did wreak devastation and havoc and you know trauma and personal suffering and so forth, it was also from the start much more of a membrane almost than a yeah because people did continue to move across it, maybe not in equal not equally as much in the same direction, but it was more permeable than um often we think about when we think about the frontiers yeah. that partition yeah. produced. And that might help to make, well, not to make, but to reinforce Sin's particular history and its particular yeah. experience of what was a sub, you know, subcontinental wide political re reconfiguration after 1947. So as a historian, I suppose that's the sort of thing I think about, which is maybe slightly not different, but we, we we come to these questions from maybe slightly different disciplinary yeah. directions. Yeah. yeah. In fact, in my I mean, I, go on. Question yeah. of question of borders and question of territories actually took me to questions of borders in language, in the yes. sense that I would see Sindhi taper into Kachi, and Kachi into Gujarati. And I, in fact, a lot of my work actually got built later on the more discursive nature of border making, but also played out on different sites. And in some sense, language became both the artillery through which borders are formed, but language was also the body on which the borders were formed, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the Sindhi language is very a very interesting case in that sense, that it does remain one of the very few examples of a trans-border language that produces literary audiences on both sides that share work with each other. And I think that is the amazing part about the Sindhi literary history. Yes. And I think, I mean, again, you will, un, you know, you will be much better placed to explain this than me, but just in my encounters, you know, over time, you know, I, ca I came across, you know, people say, Urdu speakers in Sindh who used to say, they couldn't understand a word of Sindhi. And I used to think to myself, but I'm just learning Urdu. And even with the Urdu I have, I can follow a bit of what Sindhis are saying. 
and it's not completely impervious to me. So what do they mean by this? And obviously, you know, it's 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 what people choose to kind of recognize yes. or admit yes. or acknowledge. Yeah. The yes. same point was being yes. made also with Punjabi. And I thought that's even more strange for me to understand because you know, these are these languages are not sealed off, they're not in silos as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But yeah. but people hear what they want to hear, perhaps yeah. that's one way of putting yeah. it. And and certainly, you know, you've been talking about subsequent developments on the Indian side and why yeah. um, language there has become so important in not just looking back, but looking forward as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, Trisha, you want to come in with something? Yeah, I just, uh, I realized that we've been talking about language so much, uh, but uh, perhaps uh, we should refer back to the title of the talk, which is Sins Real and Imagined. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, what are other uh, aspects of uh, one's claim to being a Sindhi uh, that allow for uh, sins to be imagined and reimagined uh, through the everyday experience of, uh, um, you know, mediating, navigating through, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, things like trade, occupation, um, uh, religion, uh, especially since uh, even being a Hindi, uh, Hindu Sindhi, uh, you know, it, it brings up several kinds of strands. Uh, we're not just talking about, uh, um, you know, somebody who prays to the Hindu pantheon, of course, we're also talking about uh, people who, um, you know, uh, visit darbars that are dedicated to certain bhagats from Sindh. Uh, we have, we have Julila. So there are several strands of uh, uh, religious practice also that exist among the Hindu Sindhis uh, in India as well as uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, but what are these pockets of everyday experience uh, that allow one to uh, imagine or reimagine this besides language? Yeah, no, I was, you know, you brought up religion there, and I, as I understand it, you know, that's the focus of your own research, really, isn't it? So um, you'll know, um, in a way, the, the context that I, I explored when I looked at the role of peers in Sindhi society, let's say, politics, society, and so forth, during the colonial period. Um, and, you know, while I was focusing on um, the, the shrines, the, the families of these kind of, let's call them original saints, however far back we have to go to find them. You know, one thing that came through very strongly is just how, you know, how, how important sin's religious past is to our understanding of it as a place, as a, as a real place. Forget about, the, you know, the imagined, side of things and um going back again to something i wasn't don't know if it was you or rita who said it but this idea that somehow sin kind of bleeds or blends into punjab and then that's all you really need to know i mean i um encountered um comments that you know what when i was studying peers and sin as to what was the point real really of looking at cindy peers because we already had studies of peers in somewhere like the Punjab and really there was no difference. But in a sense, there was a difference because Sindh as a place was in a different position to the Punjab. It had a different relationship with uh, you know, the rest of the subcontinent. It had a different sort of demographic um, reality. Yeah? Under the colonial period, it was experiencing a different set not completely different, but a, a distinct set of, of, of um, experiences, thanks to this sort of ongoing impact of, of the colonial regime. And so I do think that um, religion is important, you know, in sin, but in sin today, if we're talking about real sin, yeah, we're talking about somewhere with all sorts of contradictions in my mind built into it, because on the one hand, there will be Sindhis who who, who take a lot of pride in almost being, hmm, how could you put it, more secular, this idea of sin being a secular place. Now by secular, I think what is meant is that, you know, um, 
more synchronous, you know, more more all embracing, more all of, I mean, I'm talking about what people say rather than what necessarily exists. Um, but on the other hand, there will be uh, very orthodox yeah, ways of interpreting religion and, you know, whether that's Islam, whether that's Hinduism, there are obviously rifts yeah, developing between and within sins, um, non-Muslim communities um, over matters linked to their religious identity or their religious status. So I do think religion very much lies at the heart of a lot of the conundrums and the challenges of getting, getting to understand what the real sin was in the past and what it continues in a way to be into the present. So that that's my I, again I haven't got an easy answer to any of this because it's it unfolds in a, in a sense as we speak it's not hasn't been static I mean one of the things I think that I used to get sort of not said to me but there was this impression in the literature about sin and sin was marginalised in the sort of historical writing of the subcontinent you know way back from the colonial period onwards but that sin was a sort of bit of a sleepy backwater where things didn't really happen and therefore it wasn't that important to know what was going on and that's despite the fact that Karachi you know was growing during the colonial city colonial period I should say into you know one of the major ports of South Asia but also one of the major ports of the British Empire and so you know change was definitely taking place at speed at great momentum but I do think that um that that perhaps, and I'm sorry, I've slightly lost my train of thought there because there's so many different things that people are raising. But I, I would just repeat that um, religion, you know, is is one aspect of sin's sort of collective identity that we can't sidestep. We have to we have to engage with it, and we have to recognise its complexity. Um, Rita, you know, obviously. Um, or maybe it was Trisha hinted at this when they talked about the way in which maybe Sindhi Hindus get um, uh, seen as a certain kind of Hindu by others in India today. So those are just some random thoughts. Apologies for the randomness of them. I am sure, Rita, you can, you can be much more coherent than me about what I'm just saying. No, no, saying. no. <laughs> it is, you know, I think the fascinating part about your work is that it both underscored the religion but it also actually, in some sense, complicated and troubled the category of the Sufi so much, which no other book has done. I mean, oh, that's the, kind of you to say so. Yeah. In the in in this whole invocation and this imagining Sindh to be this syncretic place and a place where, of course, the Hindus and Muslims and everyone lived happily and so on. Uh, I think your work made a very important intervention. I mean, we heard of peels and murids only in this romanticized manner. And you made a very important intervention there and troubled it and complicated the question of religion there. As to what happens now and then, I think it's such a new can of worms that I'm not sure whether we have the time to go into it. I mean, the largest number of Sindhi Hindu followers are electorally of the majoritarian uh, affiliation, right? And uh, how do they actually process the idea of religion? But then what Trisha was mentioning earlier, and that's the work that she's doing when she looks at these other little traditions, right? Of the Darbars and the Tikana and the Julelal followers. I've been very interested, for instance, in the satsang tradition of India. And I come from a very, very big satsang family where almost everyone has some, in the, some sense, it's a spillover, Sarah, of Sindh life into the diaspora that everyone in my family has a guru. And okay. it is a far more meaningful institution than temple is, right? Okay. So uh, I think there is a lot there to be said and to go into, but I have a feeling that will just take us sort of to another topic altogether. And we've already been, I think, yes. well over 45 minutes in this discussion. Trisha, what do you have to say? Uh, I think we are moving into a conversation that could very well last over another hour. So Perhaps we should take a pause now. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Ansari and Professor Kothari for sharing with us such remarkable personal and academic journeys, uh, unraveling the many aspects of the region, as well as the elements that stand in for synth for those who don't live there. 
um, your reflections brought home to us that the impressions that we have of Sindh are indeed diverse. Uh, that proximity to the region can sometimes be imagined. Uh, it can sometimes also be curated. The nuances of the abrasion of the Sindhi language that Professor Kothari pointed out and the many cartographies it engenders away from the geographical are a vital part of this proximity. Thank you, Professor Ansari, for bringing up the image of the membrane to replace the many other gory impressions that the border carries. Uh, it allows for not only movement of people, but also movement of ideas and, of course, conversations such as these. Thank you, Tlisha, and all the Thank rest you. of your work. Same from me. Ajba utra paar de taare ki tawar Ajba utra paar de taare ki tawar Har na Har na har sambara Mujha sarata sangar Ajba mujhe yaar Vasan ga vesakya Ajba utra paar de अजब उतर पार दे ककर तो कार करे अजब उतर पार दे ककर तो कार करे वसे तो वन पुड़ो कालक खंड भरे विजन नसान वरे मुझे सकार न सुख दिए हो तो क्या सिंधी सारे Oh, don't get sindhili, sorry, sorry.